Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the London School of Economics. Uh, my name is Minu Shafiq, and I'm the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science. And it is a huge honor for me to welcome John Sexton and Gordon Brown to the LSE today. As I'm sure you're aware, John Sexton served as the 15th president of NYU from 2002 to 2016. He is currently NYU's Benjamin Butler Professor of Law and Dean Emeritus of the Law School and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. President Emeritus Sexton also serves on the board of the Institute of International Education and is the past chair of the American Council on Education. Gordon Brown, well, talk about someone who really doesn't need an introduction. Oh. <laughs> I, um, he um, is the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and uh, is currently the United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education, where he has devoted a huge amount of energy to expanding access to education to the very poorest parts of the world and many, many more things, but I will move on. Professor John Sexton is here tonight to discuss his latest book, Standing for Reason, the University in a Dogmatic Age, the introduction of which was written by Gordon Brown. Now, John has always been a leading thinker on the role of higher education in society. But I think recent events in our societies, I think I get the sense, compelled him to write this book, which is a, a deeply personal story. He argues that secular dogmatism has come to dominate our political discourse and that our universities are the last hope to stem the tide of dogmatism and that universities can effect reform in our societies by inculcating the values of reason and openness in our students and by sending those students to become one generation after another the citizens of the future who carry those values into our society. And he challenges all of us at universities to seize this historic opportunity. Just a few logistics. Uh, some may think that Twitter is the source of the dogmatism, but tonight we do have a hashtag for tonight's event with the wonderful hashtag of hashtag LSE reason. Uh, I, I'd ask you also to please turn your phones off. We will be doing a live webcast as well as taping the event for podcast going forward. And as usual, after the lecture, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of both John Sexton and Gordon Brown. John will also be signing books on stage after the event for those who would like one. So with that, please join me in welcoming Professor John Sexton to the London School of Economics. <laughs> so first of all, Manoush, thank you. Thank you for welcoming me to this spectacular place, which in many ways is synonymous with reason. I thank you for your warm hospitality. Thank you all for coming. I know how valuable your time is. And most of all, thank you to a man who is one of my heroes, Gordon Brown, who's been a steadfast friend and uh, who in some ways is responsible for s identifying the windmills that I tilt in my life uh, because he himself is such a carrier of the enlightenment and thought. A and it's impossible to be in his presence and not be call to your higher self. And he's very good at encouraging uh, the fight for the commons. And this entire enterprise is in some way attributable to his encouragement. So the plan, uh, Manush and I know each other reasonably well, but she, she doesn't know me as well as, 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 as the folks back in New York do. And, uh, we kind of caucused about how we would do this, and uh, she gave uh, gave me unbelievable license to to to, to open. And uh, 
you know, the word address was used. I've, I've, I've never, I don't think, given an address. I barely dress. I mean, this is, a, this is a, Gordon was startled that I had a tie on, and you know, this is a, those of you that have discerning fashion eyes will notice this is Travel Smith expandable waist pants and a Travel Smith, you know, probably carcinogenic jacket, but it doesn't creak at all. You can carry it, put it in a bag, duffel bag. Uh, but the plan is that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you a sense of the argument that I make in the book. The, uh, and uh, we, we decided in the end it would be somewhere between 12 minutes and 35 minutes. So, so there's a lot of latitude here. My guess is it's, it'll be about 20 or so. And uh, we're trying to leave a lot of time for you to ask questions because I know LSE is noted for that. And, um, but l let me kind of give you a, a sense of background. And uh, I've been mightily resistant to the idea of uh, of, of writing anything like a memoir. Uh, but for those of you that do take a look at the book and I, I, I just bulletin, you, you, I, I'm, you, if you read, you can read the first 60% on Google Books for free. So you don't, you don't have to buy, I'm not here to sell books. And, but on the other hand, all the money from the, any of the writing I do, uh, uh, goes to financial aid for students at NYU. So it's a good cause. It's a good cause. Uh, and that's 100% uh, goes in. Uh, so uh, if you want to, you, you'll, you'll see the, the preface of the book, which is entitled, Charlie Sent Me. And, 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 and Charlie, if you went to NYU Abu Dhabi, certainly in the first five years or 10 years when I was still involved deeply in the choice of the classes, or if you went to NYU Shanghai and you said to the students in either place, you know, Who's, whose idea was this? Who created this? They would answer in unison, Charlie. And, and Charlie is the greatest teacher I ever had. Charlie taught me at a Jesuit high school in Brooklyn. You, you can tell this is a Brooklyn accent, by the way. Okay. Uh, uh, up in... Uh, Glasgow, they were giving me an honorary degree once in, a, in, in the cathedral, and the crier got up and spoke in mellifluous, baritone, Scottish-accented tones. And when I got up, I told everybody, take out your phones, turn them on, turn on record. You're now going to hear English spoken the right way. You know, <laughs> this is an unadorned Brooklyn accent, OK? Uh, and, and this Jesuit high school was in Brooklyn, and Charlie was the teacher there, and, 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 and an awful lot of the philosophy that's behind what NYU has brought to higher education as the first instantation, I hope, of what will be more common, we call it the Global Network University, is just the playing out within the institutional structure of a university of something that Charlie taught us when he looked at us. He, he looked like uh, Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken. He had premature white hair even in his 30s. He was a large man. Somebody once said he had the body of Orson Welles, the voice of James Earl Jones, and the soul of St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> and he looked out at, there were 12 of us that had him every morning uh, for an hour from eight to nine for the entire four years of high school for a course that the Jesuits just called Charlie. And he once looked out, he said, boys, Life is about playing additional octaves of the piano. If there are notes you haven't touched, if there's a food you haven't tasted, if there's a music you haven't heard, if there's a prayer you haven't said, if there's a kind of person you've not met, if there's a place in you could get to that you haven't been, as long as it's legal and moral, try it once. <laughs> you know, and that's led me to jump into the Arctic Ocean in a bathing suit. And uh, uh, I'm about to go up to the Everest base camp and spend two nights in a rookery with the emperor penguins. And that's all Charlie's octaves of the piano. And essentially, that's been my educational philosophy. Charlie sent me. But uh, as I say, I've resisted mightily the idea of writing a memoir, an autobiography, or anything like that. But, 
friends who were reading my draft, including Gordon, kind of pushed me to put personal stuff into this. And what came out was a, really a, a pair of books. I'm going to mention the first one only fleetingly, but it's in a way the, the one that liberated the book we're discussing tonight and, um, is a predicate or at least a complement to it. Uh, it was called, is called, Baseball as a Road to God. And it analyzes American baseball as a religion. And essentially, it's an argument against doctrine. And that doctrine is not the defining element of religion. It's more in the tradition of Marcia Eliade and Rudolf Otto and William James and the experiential, the, the mystical, experiential, ineffable side of religion. And it's, it's a book I wrote after the the sudden death of my wife. Uh, and uh, it was the first time I, I came out spiritually, because NYU is a secular university. And it's, uh, it's not fashionable uh, among the cognoscenti to be spiritual. And I, I, Baseball as a Road to God, which is, came out of a course I had been teaching at NYU that analyzes baseball using the tools. I have a PhD in religion, so it uses the tools of religion. Uh, and serious religious study as a phenomena to, uh, to play. And then having written that book, Standing for Reason is the other side. So if, if one thinks of, uh, like Abram Heschel says, there is the known, there is the knowable but not yet known, and there's the ineffable. And if baseball is a road to God is about the ineffable, then standing for reason is about the known and the knowable but not yet known, the, the agenda of the research university. And uh, there was a time, I, I, I was dean of NYU's law school for 14 years and then president of the university for 14 years. And uh, about nine years into my time as dean, at the law school, the trustees of the university began to push me to move over to become president of the university. And I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I didn't see how you know, the Jesuits train you that if you're blessed with talent, as all of us in this room are, that imposes an obligation to live a useful life, a life for others, a life for the common. And I didn't see how simply making NYU better as a university was a useful life. Whereas I saw producing lawyers who were humanists in the Tocquevillian, Jeffersonian tradition, you know, I, I felt that was a useful thing, you know, and cre creating a law school that was deeply committed to community was useful. And we use the largest private university probably in the world. It's in the United States. You know, it's 60,000 students, 7,000 faculty members. I mean, you couldn't be the parish priest to that. Being a cardinal is a cartoon. So uh, I, I, I resisted it. And, and then there came a moment where, uh, boy, this is painful to bring up here. I'm going to do it. So there was a friend of mine named Dan Doctoroff who in the early 1990s decided he wanted to bring the Olympics to New York. And uh, he enlisted two of us, I was one of the two, to work with him to bring the Olympics to New York. He later became deputy mayor under Mike Bloomberg, but this was before he was deputy mayor. But we would have breakfasts, and he would come to the breakfasts with great data. You know, I'm still dean at a law school at this point, right? And uh, he would come with great data. So one of the pieces of data he would come with, he said, you know, New York is the first city, sorry, London, first city in the world that has a neighborhood for every country in the world <clears throat> populated by people born in that country. But more than that, the people in those neighborhoods, if you go there, you'll hear the music from the old country, you'll taste the food, you'll hear the language. But if you say to them, what are you? They'll say, I'm a New Yorker. And when he said that, it was kind of magical to me because I had been 
I had been raised, more on this in a moment, on the streets of Brooklyn, in, in, in the small world of Irish Catholic culture. And, and this man was telling a story of a city that was the first ecumenical city. It was the writings of Teilhard de Jardin. It was the, the, the dream of Pope John XXIII, who taught us that there was joy in playing those other octaves of the piano and getting into genuine dialogue. Now, now this metaphor is core to the book Standing for Reason. I don't know if you know here the name Daniel Berrigan. My students at NYU don't know the name Daniel Berrigan anymore, so I'm sure that at least those that are under 40 in the room don't know the name Daniel Berrigan. Daniel Berrigan was a Jesuit priest who literally, it is not an exaggeration, was the Martin, Martin Luther King of the peace movement in the United States. He and his brother Philip, who was a priest, not a Jesuit, uh, Danny and Philip Berrigan were part of what were called the Catonsville Nine. This was, when, when Danny died about three years ago, the, the front page of the New York Times, Danny Berrigan was my high school religion teacher at that high school in Brooklyn. Now at the time, he was not yet a political activist, he was a poet. But, but it, was, it, it was there. The, the, the point is, this is not some retrograde person. Right? This was going to be a, a, a great social leader. And in class, in the same classroom Charlie inhabited, he wrote on the blackboard four Latin words one morning. Extra ecclesia nulla salis. Outside the church, there's no salvation. And, and I went up to him after class and I said, Father Berrigan, does that mean that my best friend, Jerry Epstein, here I drop a footnote. <laughs> there are many things on my resume that Manoush could have picked up. This is not on my resume, but it is something of which I am proud. I hope you know the name Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson was the first black to play in American baseball. He wore the number 42. I have the number 42 on my academic gown in his honor. You are looking at the Jackie Robinson of the B'nai B'rith Little League. <laughs> I was the first Christian to play with the Jewish kids. In okay. So Jerry Epstein was my best friend. So I said to Danny Berrigan, does that mean my friend Jerry Epstein can't go to heaven? And Danny Berrigan in 1956 said to me, John, if you don't baptize him, he will not go to heaven. That was the Catholic triumphalism of the streets of Irish Catholic Brooklyn. And we didn't look for the real truths to critical reasoning. The real, the important stuff had been revealed and was given to us through the source of revelation, Rome. And even good Presbyterians they didn't have a shot <laughs> unless we secretly baptized them <laughs> and forget, you know, the Hindus and the, you know, what, the, the, what, you know, it, it, it was, it was religious triumphalism. And then came Teilhard de Jardin. And then came John the 23rd. And then came that magical moment of the ecumenical movement. And, and uh, the four years I was in college, 59 to 63, were four of the five years of the Vatican Council. And, and then, in part because I was an utter academic failure, the, my, my, the, the, the students at NYU, but especially my children, loved the fact that, that my college grade point average was 2.1 <laughs> on a scale of four. I mean, you needed two to graduate, and I barely made it, okay? But, but, but uh, a great educator, the man that created the modern Georgetown, made, took it from being third rate to first rate, a man named Timothy Healy, uh, was then a priest at, at Fordham, and Tim Healy stopped me on the quadrangle on the way to class. I was going to class for a change in the last semester of my senior year because I couldn't afford to miss any more classes and get another D. I wouldn't have graduated. So, so I'm going off to class. Ironically, they made us wear uh, uh, academic gowns to philosophy and theology. 
which of course for those of us that lived in the dorms just meant we rolled out of bed, didn't even put pants on, just put the, I mean, it was exactly the opposite of, you know, that this is sacred, you know. And I'm going off to class in my academic gown and Healy stops me. He had recruited me to Fordham to be Fordham's first Rhodes Scholar. And I had disappointed him. And he looked at me and said, son, you've been a big disappointment. <laughs> the Jesuits don't compromise. And I said, I'm very sorry. I tried to explain him what I've been, uh, I don't want to hear. But the Vatican Council has happened. It's going to be important for Catholics to understand other religions. We're starting a PhD program in religion. We'll pay you to go to school. I said, you know, religion's pretty interesting. I was an unusual graduate student in the fact that I knew I was going to spend my life in the discipline, but I was interested in it. They're going to pay me to study, you know, what, what's not to like about that? You know, keep my mother, my father had died, keep my mother who's praying for my soul at bay. I'm studying religion, for God's sake. How could she complain? But that got me into this ecumenical movement, right in the sweet spot of it. And it shaped my whole worldview. And it was nothing more than Charlie's octaves at the piano, you see. The other thing that happened then, and then I'm going to tie all this together very quickly. Believe it or not, I'm spelling out the theory of a university here for you, okay? And it'll all come together, I hope, quickly. What are they doing behind me? Are they making fun of me? <laughs> so, so, Charlie's, uh, you got to remember, I was a year and a half younger than grade, so I was a, a very immature. I, as I entered, my sophomore year of high school, Charlie stopped me in the hall and he said, young man, you're studying far too much. <laughs> See, this was Charlie. He said, you must engage yourself in something that broadens you. Now, he ran the drama society, but he said to me, go be a debater. Go be a competitive debater. And this shaped the next 18 years of my life. Because the next three years I engaged in competitive debate. And as I graduated, I was the national high school debate champion. And then when my father died, I, for some reason I can't explain. Charlie had impelled me to be a teacher. Okay, I was gonna be a teacher. All through my 14 years as dean and 14 years as president, I taught a full faculty schedule. Minimum four courses a year because I was put on earth to be a teacher. This is my 60th year of teaching. Okay, I couldn't live without teaching. And uh, I got on the subway, went out to my sister's high school, and I rang the doorbell, and I said to the, the nun, the religious woman that ran the school, would you let me start a high school debating team here? And for the next 15 years of my life, that group of students was the center of my life, 100 hours a week, which is why I was never in class. Okay, but I was out in Brooklyn with, the, with, with, quote, the girls, as we would call them at the time. Mm -hmm. All of whom, you know, they've gone on to be presidents of colleges and lawyers and doctors and so forth. All from a high school where very few went to college. But every debater went to college on a scholarship. And that became my passion. But what is competitive debate about? Think about it. Don't think about these debates that they do in the political arena today. Mm -hmm. Okay, competitive debate here are its basic characteristics in those days. There have been modifications today. One topic for the year. So you might be the top team in October. If you didn't advance your thinking, advance your understanding, read more books, get deeper arguments, you were toast by December because the tournaments would occur and the top teams would be doing the final debate in front of everybody. Everybody would have the arguments. You had to keep advancing. Second, in the individual debate, there are four iterations of the argument. If you just repeat the talking points that you said first, the way they do in political debates, the judge in the back of the room is, is doing a flow chart to see if there's an extension and deepening of the argument. And then, perhaps most important of all, you didn't know which side you were going to be on until the coin was flipped. So you had to prepare both sides of the argument. You had to prepare every variation of the case. And the single, this is counterintuitive. People don't realize this until you say it. Then they say, aha. The single most important attribute of a champion debater is that he or she is a very, very good listener. 
Because if you don't understand fully the argument that's being made by your opponent, you can't join issue with it in a way that will impress the judge who's following this. Now, just think about that for a second. Now, you combine that, okay? So here is my four-part argument in four minutes based upon what I've now said to you. And then I'm going to stop, go back and sit down, and we'll see what Gordon has to say. <laughs> okay? So part one of the book is this. I have lived and observed a 60-year arc beginning in 1956 when Danny Berrigan made those comments in that classroom book and to 2016, because that's nice, 60 years, right? And I have lived in a world where I could go from extra ecclesia nulla solace and really believe it to where I could be with a couple of hundred representatives of 25 different faith traditions in a conversation about how all of us benefit, not by seeking some uh, Esperanto of theology or some least common denominator golden rule, but by really getting into what Raimundo Panikar, who was one of the liberation theologians who influenced Francis, what Raimundo Panikar calls a dialogic dialogue, where you, you, you put yourself in the being and space of the other person and understand how that person sees the world, that's part A, and importantly, how that person sees you. Turns out this is also the secret to real I, thou, love. But that's a whole different talk, okay? If you can see yourself as the thou sees you. But in any case, that's a dialogic dialogue, right? So, so this is the ecumenical dialogue. And, and I have seen over a 60-year arc tremendous progress from that point of triumphalism in 56 to where we are today. Not that it's perfect by any means, but the progress would have been unimaginable to us back then. Meanwhile, in 1956, my father was running the Jefferson Democratic Club in Brooklyn. And he worked with everybody to make the place safe, to get the garbage picked up, to get the dreams of families fulfilled. And, and yes, there were political elections and there were political parties and so forth, but people worked for our common. And the word compromise wasn't a dirty word. And yet today, 60 years later, and it did not start five years ago. In the book, I trace it. Uh, well, I wrote first about it in 1995. Okay, so. Uh, I call it, there is a deep allergy to nuance and complexity that has developed in society. And we have developed in our political discourse what I call secular dogmatism that is just as virulent as that theological dogmatism of extra ecclesia nulla salis was. So what's the antidote? The antidote, in my view, the, the last best hope in a way is the university because the university has in it characteristics, if you think about it, okay? Now, I, met, I, I use competitive debate as a metaphor for the ideal of the traditional university. But, but also think about what we do, right? All of us, I mean, I flew across the ocean just for this. <laughs> and I'm not selling books. But we care about getting our ideas out. Right? We want, you're, in, you're listening to me. You're taking me seriously. You're going to come at me and test my ideas, and they're going to get better because of that. Right? That's what we do. We want our views, we put them out. We want them disseminated as widely as possible. And then we expect people to be trying to make their, I mean, the person that shows that E equals MC squared is wrong is going to be a hero. There is no final orthodoxy. Everything's always testable. And we build on prior generations, but we know we're nowhere near the end. I mean, for God's sake, think of that for a moment. That's what universities, that's in their sinew. And that's the antipode of where our politics is. So the university, I argue, even in its traditional form, 
Now, I'm playing, at this point, defensive ball. Okay, how do we create an antidote to the nuance of complexity? Now, once we inoculate ourselves and we have the antidote, then I propose we go on offense and we create universities that are committed to secular ecumenism, that dialogic dialogue, the embrace of the gift of difference. And that's essentially what NYU has done as a first instantation, and it has been a magnificent success. NYU Abu Dhabi, I'll focus on, okay, NYU Abu Dhabi, by any measure, by any measure, on the input side, is as selective as any school in the world. We outdraw every school in the world. If we make an offer of admission to a student, 90% of them are accepted, and we outdraw every one of the schools that you might imagine as being in the top 10. And why? Because it's a unique situation. It's a student body of 1,500 undergraduates from 144 different countries. And they're from the countries. They're not the children of expatriates who are living there. If I say kids from Peru, they have made a 20-hour plane ride. Okay, So it's 144 countries. The largest group is the American group. That's only 15% of the student body. They're not even in their own country. Think about that for a second. And it is the most diverse in any way you want to measure, but most importantly, economically diverse student body in the world. About 20% of the students that come have never been on a plane or more than 50 miles from home when they get on the plane to come. They come out of tribal villages. We have scouts out around the world. Part of what I want you to do is be scouts. And it's fully supported by the government, and they live together. Yeah, so you're, you're in a roommate of a uh, group of four, four different continents represented. <clears throat> okay? So that is the, that's ecumenism, secular ecumenism, writ large. And it's nested in an advanced research university with Nobelists and so forth teaching them in small class. My class is 20. It's a large class in NYU Abu Dhabi. And you're nested in the research enterprise. And then you tra travel around as if you're, it's, it's, these are not branch campuses. It's a circulatory system. So there are the three portals, New York, Abu Dhabi, and Shanghai. And there are the 12 other campuses, including one here in town in Bedford Square, where there are only three, always 300 NYU students on study away semesters. So that's this ecumenical university. And then the final part of my argument is you're going to go that far. If you're really going to say you're going to create an ecumenical university, then you have to get really serious about creating accessibility and affordability. Because it doesn't make any sense in claiming to be an ecumenical university if refugees or kids from tribal villages or kids from countries where the economic annual income is 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 a year, if they're not represented. And that means radically rethinking things like financial aid. So if you have a kid out of an Ethiopian tribal village, that kid needs not only tuition. Giving a tuition scholarship means nothing. They need room and board and tuition. They need money for uh, airplane tickets. They need money for clothing and so forth. And you have to reconceptualize what you're doing. And I have ideas about the financing of higher education. So that is, it's an argument for the moral imperative and the political imperative, given where we are, of a particular kind of university. But at the least, if you don't want to make the move to the affirmative case, the ecumenical university, creating communities of dialogue inside the traditional university. And I, I'm done. Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Over to you, Gordon. Well, well how do you follow that? <laughs> Go sit on the stage. I, I no, <laughs> no. sit on the stage. You've, you've heard a lot about uh, Brooklyn. You've heard a lot about New York. You've heard a lot about teachers. You've heard a lot about debating techniques. And when John was explaining them, I was thinking Michael Bloomberg might have benefited from a, a, a <laughs> and perhaps Joe Biden and perhaps a few others from uh, listening to uh, John. 
But he's far too modest uh, to tell you that he is here as probably the most successful university president in recent decades, that he's built the most uh, globally oriented uh, university, NYU, which has campuses not just in Abu Dhabi, which you mentioned, but in Shanghai, and has got study centers in about 13 or 14 places uh, around the world, that you can enter New York University, not just in New York, but as a student, you can enter in Abu Dhabi and enter in uh, Shanghai, and therefore it is genuinely a global uh, network university. And that his uh, thesis uh, is that while 50 years ago we could talk about religious dogmatism, uh, we now have to think about secular dogmatism. We now have to think whether the university is actually the only center uh, where honest discussion and uh, reason is at the center of debate and, and dialogue. Uh, and whether what the other centers in the world, which used to be part of the public square, are not fulfilling that function uh, anymore. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be at the LSE to discuss this. Uh, Manoush is uh, one of the people that I've admired greatly because she's managed to combine the skills that she brings as an academic uh, to the work that she's actually done in government over many years, not just in uh, uh, the government in Britain, but working in the international organizations. So we've got a huge amount to learn from what uh, Manoush uh, has, 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 has achieved. I actually was once uh, a university uh, uh, lecturer, uh, and uh, I used to say universities stand for reason and objectivity, rationality, the pursuit of knowledge, the search for truth, and that these were all the qualities I left behind when I went into politics. <laughs> and and, and I, I used actually to say that as a joke, but now, <laughs> now when I re read uh, John Sexton's book, I begin to think that this is uh, something that we've got to take uh, very seriously indeed. So the, re the real issue uh, the, the, this evening, and I want to throw up one or two, two ideas to join the discussion, is are there uh, is there a public square beyond the university that can foster a debate about the future of our society? Uh, are we uh, giving up on all other uh, arenas uh, of debate in our country and recognizing that the social media and other uh, forces that are dominating the debate are really the purveyors of um, uh, half-truths, uh, the purveyors of uh, fake news and, and everything else? Uh, and I, I'm going to raise that and then see what I can do to answer it. Uh, what can we do to actually create uh, a more global society? Are we simply relying on global universities to do it? Or is there anything else we can do as uh, individuals uh, uh, to, 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 to create that? And then to answer John's last question, I, I want to say something about um, universities themselves. Can we actually do something about um, access? I just give you these figures. There were 10 million, uh, 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 sorry, 100 million graduates in 1970, there were 400 million graduates. This is taking in the whole world uh, in, by 2000. There were about 700 million people who around the world of this population are graduates. But even by 2030, 2040, uh, less than 20% of the world's adults will be people with graduate uh, uh, qualifi qualifications. And we're increasingly a world where we have the educated rich uh, that is, people who have educational qualifications, there is a premium on their uh, skills as a result of that. They can earn high salaries and they can amass wealth. And then an education poor, and if you think of this globally, uh, more than 25% of the population who will never have any uh, qualifications because they've never either been at primary school or have been only at primary school and left with nothing. And then the rest of the uh, adult population who will have uh, very little qualifications, if any, uh, having done some primary education, but maybe uh, a very limited amount of secondary education. So what are we going to do about access to education in a world where I see this huge divide between the education poor and the edu education rich? So first, so I'm throwing up a, a, a few ideas. If you think they're old ideas, then just remember uh, this debate between George Bernard Shaw and uh, the young Michael Foote in, in 1945. And George, George Bernard Shaw had written an article throwing out his ideas about the future. And Michael Foote, who was a young writer editing uh, the Tribune newspaper at the time, replied to George Bernard Shaw and said, your ideas are 20 years out of date. And George Bernard Shaw took a while to reply. And he said, yes, it is true that the ideas I put out, I wrote first 20 years ago. But they were 50 years ahead of their time. <laughs> 
Yeah. First of all, the, um, the, the, um, the idea of um, the public square. Uh, yes, I agree that the universities uh, are now uh, one of the few areas where you are getting the sort of debate that John talked about uh, th th this evening. But I think we've got to think uh, again about uh, the other sources of uh, debate in our society and dialogue and building a consensus. I think the problem we've got, and this is true in America and it's true uh, in, the, uh, in Europe, uh, and it's certainly therefore true in, in the West, is that political parties have seen, ceased to be a, a way in which opinion is articulated and then aggregated in a way that the grassroots can then affect the political system. Political parties are now seen as simply a vehicle uh, for leaders to express their views and to gain, gain support. And if you join a political party, maybe 50 years ago, you expected to be able to influence the policy of it and, and influence how it directed. And therefore, you had a view of society that could actually be articulated and then expressed in the end by your leaders uh, accepting that these were legitimate views and they had to be implemented. And now that's more or less not, not the case. Is we've replaced it by a faith in social media for the time being. And social media is uh, where people think they have a direct relationship. Say Donald Trump has got 50 million people on his tweet. People are listening to Donald Trump. They're, they're taking his tweets and thinking they can reply to him and that he's someone who's ever going to listen to them. Mm. You know? mm. And this, this idea that this is a direct relationship between the person uh, and the leader, it's, 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 just, it's just everybody knows that's just an illusion. Uh, social media is a shouting match without an, an umpire. It encourages the extremes, and it's not really going to be the source of debate. We've got to find new ways, both inside and outside universities, of, of people being ex able to express the views and join a debate about the, about the future. I favor, for example, citizens' assemblies, because I feel that around the country you could call together citizens' assemblies, you could debate big issues. If you look at what happened in Ireland over issues like um, abortion, that they managed to argue these points out. Uh, at the beginning, there was uh, quite a lot of hostility from one point of view to the other. At the end, people started to understand each other's views. And actually, the debate in Ireland on abortion, which ended up with uh, the freedom uh, uh, for abortion being uh, granted in a, in a referendum, was far less uh, vicious and far less uh, hostile and far less bitter than anybody expected. So we have got to find new ways uh, of uh, this dialogue, both within universities and outside universities. Secondly, uh, the global society. John has shaped a global network university, which is bringing people together all, all across the world. If you think of globalization as simply the global sourcing of, 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 of goods and services, and globalization as the global flows of capital, if you're taught in economics, that's what you're going to be taught globalization is. John is trying to build a global community and building it uh, as he has done very successfully through a university that has tentacles all over the world. And when I was in Abu Dhabi and I saw students recruited from Africa with free tuition uh, and being given a chance uh, of education that they could never have had any, uh, in, in any other way, you do see the power of people coming together from all over the world as part of a, 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 glo a, global, a global community. The problem is that what's driving uh, the world now is not even Donald Trump, it's not even President Xi, it's not even uh, uh, what's happening in Iran. What's driving the world now is the power of nationalism. And I think we've got to face up to the fact that unless we can actually make a moral effort to counter nationalism, then a lot of what we're talking about that is happening in a global network university, a lot of what we're talking about about creating a global community is not really going to come, um, come to fruition. See, everywhere I go now, I go around um, uh, America, you go around Europe, you visit Asia, and the most dominant feature uh, is that uh, them and us, them versus us movements, us versus them movements, are driving the politics uh, of, the, of the countries. And if these nationalists are not in power, they are driving the parties that are in power to do certain things, whether it's on immigration and borders controls, or whether it's on tariffs, or whether it's on protectionism. And what I see in the last 10 years is that we've moved from what was a defensive nationalism, which was basically trade protectionism, which came in after the financial crisis. Unfortunately, we tried to stop it, but we weren't successful. You've now got an aggressive nationalism. America first, India first, China first, Russia first. An aggressive nationalism that is becoming incredibly important. So how do you actually counteract that? You've got this great idea of a global community. You've got this idea of people studying together, working together, learning together, debating together, finding a way forward together. 
but you're counteracted, you're, this has been counteracted by a populist nationalism that starts with economic insecurity and starts with cultural anxieties that people have, is fed by an anti-politic sentiment, so you're more likely to elect an entertainer than you are someone who is a professional politician. Uh, that becomes a very attractive thing to do. I mean, Italy, the, uh, the, the Five Stars movement was led by a comedian uh, who, who was uh, lucky enough not to be out of prison for his tax frauds. Ukraine elected a television star. America, as you know, elected, yeah? And, 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 so, and so you've got a world that is now driven by this nationalism, and how do you counteract it? Because nationalism is us versus them. That's what defines it. And then you're forced to make a choice. So I'm Scottish and British, but I'm forced to make a choice. Nationalists tell me I can be us or them. I can be Scottish or British. And then it's my country, right or wrong. And so the resentments, imaginary and real, are built up because someone has got to be the enemy. And then it's all or nothing. You have independence or nothing. Your, your country must be free of all foreign influences or nothing. And why in the 2020 uh, is this dominating the debate in almost every major country of the West? Um, Hungary, elections in Hungary. Remember in 2016, in the referendum in Britain, that poster, Breaking Point, the poster that was put up by Nigel Farage, and he had all these uh, uh, people who were said to be hordes of immigrants and uh, who were pouring into Europe, in his view, completely untrue. There was no white faces. Uh, it was all uh, Muslim faces. Uh, there was no women in the photograph. Uh, it was doctored so that uh, it was only, only, only men. Breaking Point, and that was his poster. Hungary elections this year, exactly the same photograph, exactly the same poster being used. Hungary, a country that has probably got more anti-immigrant parties than immigrants, <laughs> used, 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 used by the Prime Minister Orban to win an election on immigration when there was no real problem at all. Spain, Vox, fighting uh, uh, Pedro Sanchez, a great um, Prime Minister in Spain, who's trying to pull things together. And then you have two nationalist movements, Catalan versus Vox, Vox, I'm told, using exactly the same poster. You've got an international alliance of anti-internationalists who are actually making uh, these nationalist, uh, 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 the, the, these nas nationalist slogans uh, the feature of their campaign. So how do we counteract this in the modern world? Uh, and it seems to me uh, that um, what Orwell said when he made a distinction between patriotism and nationalism is still absolutely right. That you need a moral effort to put the case for solidarity, that people have a lot in common and they've got to work together, for cooperation, that you can achieve things by working uh, together, for sharing, uh, for people uh, managing to find ways of pulling and sharing resources for the common good, and if we don't put these arguments, then we are going to see nationalist movements continue to thrive in the future. So I've moved from what John started off with, because I don't know much about Brooklyn, <laughs> and I don't know much about New York, and I don't know much actually about debating techniques, because I've learned a lot from uh, what John's saying, saying, saying this evening. But I think what John actually, in, in a very modest uh, way, has, has not told you, is that his book is raising all these uh, uh, questions. It's raising the question, uh, about um, are there any other sources of uh, debate and dialogue? And I think we've got to think about that very carefully and how we can create these uh, uh, forums, create this public square again. Uh, can we actually build a global society? But to do that, we're going to have to counteract what I see as the biggest force at work today, nationalism. And then come to this issue that John finished off uh, uh, last with and where I have some responsibility as the UN envoy for global education. What do we do about a world where we make a promise in 2000 that every child should have the chance to be at school? We make a promise again in 2015 that we're going to create a world where every single child is not only at school but is going to complete secondary education by 2030. And we end up having to tell people today that there are still 260 million children not going to school. 260 million school-aged children today will not go to school. There are 400 million children who finish education at the age of 11 or 12 
with no qualifications whatsoever and never return ever into education, and half the developing world's children leave school without any qualifications whatsoever uh, and have not anything to offer an employer in terms of paper qualifications that come from their school activities. And worse than that, that because of the population rise in Africa, by 2030, there will still be 200 million children not going to school. There will still be 400 million children who are finishing their education with nothing at the age of 11. And there will still be 800 million of our children who will have no qualifications whatsoever. And therefore, that the university opportunities and higher education opportunities that are on offer uh, to, to, to young people will remain limited by their inability to get even the most basic education at school. And yes, we've got to solve the problem then of access for those who in that period will be able to get some qualifications. But you know, India would have to build a thousand universities. That's what they say themselves, a thousand universities to cater for the potential demand in, in, in India. And how do you manage a, a system where you want access for people when you know that there is no country in the developing world that can afford the cost of higher education uh, for a mass group of people uh, at, at the moment? So we will have to find, as John has tried to do for the United States, an income contingent way of funding your education. I personally favor a graduate tax in Britain as the, as the only way forward to get both justice in education and to get more access for people, but we will have to find a way globally of funding education if there's going to be any chance that we'll have the kind of uh, numbers of people given the chance, not just of a, a, a university education, but the chance to go beyond it. Because at the moment, Africa is not even able to replace its teachers and its doctors and its nurses by university graduates. So few people are actually getting education uh, in, these, uh, in these countries at, at a higher level. So three questions. Uh, can we re-energize the public square? Secondly, uh, can we actually do more to create a global society and fight nationalism? And third question, which again is raised by Brooke, and John, John has been too modest because in his book all these questions are gone through. Uh, can we do something about access to education, mm. particularly for those people who have had no chance whatsoever? What John brings out in his book is this idea that if we think about it carefully, we are actually an interdependent world. I, I, I uh, am young enough, uh, uh, old enough, sorry, to remember, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to remember John F. Kennedy becoming president of the United States of America. And some of you may know the story um, of uh, Richard Nixon, who'd lost the election. And he'd been asked, when John Kennedy gave this famous inauguration speech, they were asked, which line of this Kennedy speech that was so famous, and it's actually one of the great speeches, and anybody who hasn't read it should learn it, would you like to have given? And they said, would you like to have said, you know, the torch has passed to a new generation, which was Kennedy's great speech, talking about uh, how young people were now, and a new generation were now taking all the world, Never negotiate from fear, never fear to negotiate. This idea that you had to be strong, but you must actually negotiate, which is something that perhaps all of us should have learned uh, uh, in, given the wars that we've had in, in, in recent years. Uh, ask not what your country can do for you is a great line. Uh, ask what you can do for your country. Uh, and Kennedy went on to, to say, um, ask not what America can do for itself, but ask what it can do for the whole of humanity. Richard Nixon asked which uh, word, phrase from the Kennedy suit he said, there's only one phrase he said, I hereby accept the office of President of the United <laughs> States of America. But Kennedy went on, having said, uh, ask not what, what, uh, America, uh, what, what America can do for the world, to give this famous speech in, in Philadelphia, which again must be read, and it was a declaration. He said, America in the 1770s had a declaration of independence. This is, remember, I'm speaking in 1963. America in the 1770s had the Declaration of Independence. What we need now, he said, is a Declaration of Interdependence. And I think that's how we should start our discussions of the future of this uh, world community we're in. Uh, and please read John's book, because he goes through all the issues that I've tried to, tries to raise. And I do think he uh, brings some insights that I think are very useful for the discussion we're going to have. John, it, it, it's a great book. And the anecdotes are even greater. Thank you. <laughs> Just give one minute. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you. Okay. Is that all right? I'm going to. All right. I'm going to come back to you. No, no. Okay. I'm going to start.
start by trying to get you to respond to Gordon's questions and then open it up to the audience. And I want to start by, by saying that it's clear that people who go to university don't vote for populists and nationalists. And the closest determinant of who voted for populist parties around the world is their level of education. Um, I and thought so, Trump did go to university. Yes, but his voters didn't. <laughs> his voters didn't. It's, 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 uh, so. so the question is, is the answer to get more people to go to university? Because clearly that does something in terms of opening up your worldview, increasing your respect for reason and discourse. And is that a realistic solution? And if it's not, how do we get the public square, which universities aspire to be, to be much more public? You know, here at the LSE, we, we hold 350 public events like this every year. It's our contribution to the public square. They're, everything is open to the public. Um, but it's a drop in the bucket. And how can the debate in universities, which is in itself constrained by the culture wars, political correctness, and constrained in many ways. How can that truly engage a wider public if we're not going to be able to get everyone to benefit from a university education in the next decade or so? So first, uh, I, I, I agree with your description of uh, the attraction of populism, but I put an important caveat in that description. Uh, for those of you that are watching American politics very closely, putting aside coarseness, putting aside uh, lack of moral core, uh, putting aside uh, 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 an aggressive anti-intellectualism, now you might say, but for that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Right. You, you know, but you know, putting all that side aside and, and, and simply tracking what, 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 what you described, which is the, the populism as an attractor of highly educated people. You know, on a, on, on, on a Trump scale of 10, I, I would submit that you have probably the next nominee of the Democratic Party at at least an 8.5 in terms of attracting to uh, a populist uh, uh, agenda that has a veneer of common uh, about it, the, 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 the common square, the common enterprise, uh, the common wheel, as we used to call it in Jesuit education. It has a veneer of that, but it, it, it's highly uh, denigrating of the core fabric institutions of society. So just watch as the American election, especially in the Democratic Party, plays out on that proposition. But uh, le let's accept, arguendo, your point. I, I, I think that if I were to distill Gordon's comments and mine uh, and, and use both elements of my argument, remember I'm, I'm using a metaphor uh, of the ecumenical movement theologically as a hope for politics, uh, uh, the tools are there uh, in the ecumenical movement of dialogic dialogue. They're, they're deep in the university. Can we get them into the public square? Uh, and uh, it, it's, it, it's essentially trying to build, and I think you could explain virtually everything that Gordon and I have said, and I say in the book, it, it's, it's this uh, battle between cosmopolitanism and balkanization. Uh, or, you know, what is the attitude in dealing with humanity? Uh, what is the attitude toward the other? Mm -hmm. Is the other something to be embraced? Mm -hmm. Or is the other something that is se to be seen as a gift? Uh, and and uh, that that also gets involved in issues that my colleague, my NYU Law School colleague, Jeremy Waldron, yeah. has written about, about dignity. And, and, and how do we maintain dignity in, in a dialogue? And, and maybe you start with the word tolerance. Uh, you know, in English, uh, the word tolerance 
tends to be, I'm going to put up with you. Uh, it's been interesting to me uh, while observing the celebration of the year of tolerance in the Emirates to learn that the, the Arabic word for tolerance really has much more ecumenical meaning than I'm going to put up with you. Uh, it, it, it means I really welcome you into my world and, and uh, you know, maybe this in part comes from their uh, a Bedouin culture of sharing and welcoming the stranger out of necessity. Uh, obviously not worked out perfectly in the Gulf. I want to make sure everybody <laughs> understands. I, I understand that. Uh, but but, but uh, the attitude toward the other is the key and, and that you know, if I were to bring it to where my argument is in Standing for Reason, is the delight in encountering an argument or a conversational partner who causes you to see even what you're saying differently mm. and better. Mm. Uh, and, and sometimes that leads in overlapping Venn diagrams, sometimes it leads in compromise, but most of all, it is the delight of kind of the exponential growth of, of thought. Okay. Let me open it up to questions. I will take them in batches of three and uh, invite both Gordon and John to respond to them. Let me see some hands here. I need a woman. There's one right there. There's another there. there. Okay. Let me start with you over here. I'll take the mics over here. This woman here, and then the gentleman there, and the gentleman there, and then I'll move over here. If you could just briefly introduce yourself and then ask a question. Hi, thank you very much for your talks. My name is Kate and I'm a student here at the European Institute. I just have a question, if I can have a political question. It's not directly related to, to the wider topic of today. I was thinking deeply about how to link it, but I couldn't uh, think of a way, so I'm just going to ask it. Um, We're ranging I, widely this evening. Yeah. Um, so I actually have a question uh, for Mr. Brown and on the recent developments between number 10 and number 11. <laughs> and um, <laughs> was you having having had so much experience in in the treasury, of course, uh, would have an opinion on this. And uh, I was wondering if you could describe an optimal relationship between between uh, number ten and the treasury, and whether whether you think that the treasury should have more autonomy or authority, which was maybe the case. You know, just just a brief co comment on that. Pat. That was Thank me you. and Tony. Optimal that relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Quite very well. <laughs> I'll give you some time to think about it. <laughs> oh, you don't agree? <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Uh, my name's Charlie. I'm a philosophy student at UCL. Um, going back to the talk, um, what role do you think religion or religious institutions play in the future of advocating reason? Namely, do you think there's any tension between critical thinking and religious belief. Okay, thank you very much. And the gentleman behind there in the greenish brown shirt, yeah. That's you, yeah, yeah, that's you. Sorry, I didn't think I was wearing a greenish brown shirt. I was sort of, yeah, I was. <laughs> Uh, hi, um, my name's um, Bill Wildy. I work um, for the Tony Blair Institute. Um, <laughs> what did you say? He works for the Tony Blair Institute. You, you can answer the first question then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am actually going to ask a, a question about the, the talk, though. Um, so I, I was an undergrad at the LSE, and when I was an undergrad at the LSE, um, I was a bit of a debating addict myself. Uh, I kind of currently consider myself to be still a bit of a recovering debater. Um, so in, in debate, yeah, it's tr true that you listen, but you have to take into account the intention with which you listen to someone. And the intention that you listen to someone in debating is to destroy their arguments, or at the very least, if they're on like the same side as you, but not the same team as you, to emphasize your particular contributions over them. Fundamentally, in debating, you're not trying to pursue truth. You're trying to pursue persuasion. You're trying to get everyone else to think that you, in particular, are right. Mm -hmm. And I think you see this in academia as well, kind of in the body as is. Success is often gained by academics um, by attacking ideas that already exist. 
and it doesn't necessarily matter whether you're right, it matters more whether you're persuasive in terms of your ability to form a successful um, academic career. So in terms of that, I don't really see debate as a departure from the status quo. In fact, within universities, I feel like sometimes we might have too much of it. And that's not to say debate is a bad thing. Obviously, I'm engaging in a critical dialogue right now, but I don't necessarily see it as um, the path to true for maybe as valuable as perhaps you do. Okay, thank you very much. John, I, I, debating I, 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 and religion and reason. I, I can't resist just a one-line answer to the last question, which is I'm now going to try to destroy your point. <laughs> 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 so I take us a hostile point. No. But, but you see, that's exactly the difference. Uh, I'm not going to stretch the debate metaphor too far. Okay, I, I, I introduced debate, if you go back to what I said, as, as a heuristic, it was a, a, a kind of approach uh, that, that had various elements to it, one of which was that you had to understand the fullness of the power of the points on both sides. Now, when you put it in the context in which you've been doing it recently, and I did it years ago, it's, it's competitive debate, right? I'm not offering competitive debate as the, the paradigm in which we should shape universities, but it's the tools that one brings to it uh, of, uh, that I described, the elements of debate, where you extend the argument, where you, you try to see both, both, both sides. And of course, that's the difference between what we're doing now and what we would be doing if the audience was going to vote as to whether you or I won the way a judge does at the end of a debate round. So I, I think I'm making a heuristic point with the metaphor to debate. Now, the real point I'm making, of course, uh, is, is, is a metaphor to ecumenism and trying to bring the tools of ecumenism. Is That is different from the question of, of what the role of religion is in our campuses. And, 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 and here I would say to you that, you know, as Stephen Jay Gould said, uh, Religion and science are two different, and I'm using science now in the root Latin sense of science, uh, shield, knowledge, okay, what we do at universities. These are two different magisteria. A and you'll recall I introduced the word ineffable, yeah. you know, the domain where love lives, okay? The, uh, I did not persuade Lisa that I loved her scientifically, <laughs> okay? It was, it was Deep. This is why I don't like the way when people use the word myth as a synonym for fiction or falsehood. Mythos, the, the, the poets, the music, the, 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 the great legends that contain the ineffable truth, the experienced truth uh, that, that Eliot talks about. So read my book, Baseball is a Road to God, and you'll get a sense of that. And, and I, I think that begins to answer your question about the role of faith in dialogue. We are or we can be, not everyone is, but William Douglas, famous, I teach a course on religion and government, right? And, and it's very interesting to teach that course in the various campuses of the global network because in the United States, it's radical separation of church and state. How could you have tolerance in a state with, that has an official religion like the Church of England or Islam in, Emir in the Emirates, you know, and yet, you have other models, right? But don't bring your faith in as scientific evidence, okay? Something that you believe is, you know, so, so it gets very interesting. I was the lawyer for the prevailing side in the United States Supreme Court, uh, having invalidated a Louisiana statute that said if you taught evolution in the public schools, you had to teach creation science. <clears throat> and our winning argument, and I remember looking at Nino Scalia as I made the argument, knowing <laughs> that even though he knew the truth of what I was going to say, he would write his dissent based on originalism and so forth. But, but our winning argument was that evolution is not a theory of beginning. It's a theory of development, whereas Creation ex nihil is a theory of beginning and inherently gets us into the God space. And, 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 and when you're in the God space, you're not in our debate. 
that. Okay, thank you. I think I'll come back to the woman here. Did he answer about 10 and 11? <laughs> <laughs> I think you got a sense of his answer, I think. We're uh, letting it rest there, eh? <laughs> exactly. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah, life is about that. The woman here, and then the gentleman there, and then the gentleman there. And then I'll come to the top in the next round, if I could. Yeah, the, the woman in the green... Uh, Um, I'm Susan, and I'm a retired social historian, not hysterian, historian, sorry. Um, and I've, I've become a, a visually impaired person five years ago, and I am so grateful for these lectures, for these events. I come regularly. They mean the world to me. The team is wonderful to me. The, the whole events team and, and the LSE, and it's just great. Thank you. And to just Thank be you. able to get on a bus, get off the bus, get on the tube, get off the tube, and I'm here. And at, uh, yeah, I in fact I, I gave the schedule to somebody at my GP surgery today because she said you go to all these things. I said, well, it's easy. You're just here. And and uh, but as somebody who also was re remembers the Kennedy inaugural, what the hell? has happened. <laughs> <laughs> there is such a nastiness out there now, and it's so painful. Mm. The nastiness on the streets, mm. the lack of please, thank you, excuse me, yeah. pardon. There's something going on out there, and I, I, I read a wonderful um, editorial piece by Roger Cohen in the New York Times a couple of years ago, um, where he referred to Delmore Schwartz, who described America as the land of sure. Can you do it? Sure. Should we try it? Sure. <laughs> What's happened to that? Okay. Thank you very much for that question, and thank you very much for your comment about our, our lectures, and welcome to our public square. Uh, the gentleman in the beige jumper behind you. Hello, uh, my name is Yuri. Um, I'm a member of the public, not related to LSC, uh, unfortunately. But uh, thank you very <laughs> much for the you talk. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that uh, universities are bastions for uh, uh, bastions of prison, and uh, uh, that people in universities, both students and uh, teachers, they tend to be very much against populism and. Uh, uh, this is absolutely correct, and the thing is that the opposite side of the argument, populists, they are well aware of this fact, and uh, you are probably, uh, uh, probably everyone here knows that uh, uh, their argument against that is that, uh, you see, the, uh, universities are not the best students, they are really, uh, they indoctrinate people, you are not allowed to have an opposite opinion, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, this is something that we need to fight against, because no diversity of thought is allowed. Now, I'm playing the devil's um, uh, Davos advocate here because this is not really my belief. I uh, uh, probably not on that side, not probably, but like, anyway. But uh, 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 my question is how would you counter this argument? Because, as you said, you need to get in other people's shoes and to try to see their position. So they look at the university, they see a lot of people who uh, are, uh, uh, who hold the very same opinion about very different things. And uh, uh, it does look like a tyranny of thought if you already tuned into this wavelength, right? So how would you counter that? Okay, thank you very much. And then find the, the gentleman with the black shirt back there. So, and you do talk a lot in the book about the liberal bias in the academy and how uh, Thanks for your talk. Uh, I, my name is Jaden. I'm an international student in the UK. Uh, although universities are becoming more and more uh, international today, the fact is lots of in, uh, overseas students are charging at a much higher price than the native stu students. So in my opinion, uh, this is a kind of tariff or protectionism. And do you think this kind of protectionism <laughs> should be cancelled to some extent? Okay, very good. I'll start with John and then have, let Gordon have a, yeah. have a say. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. I'll <laughs> answer that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, <laughs> I don't know how... I don't, I don't know how, I think I'll just give a short answer to the last question and then work through the previous ones together. But the, 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 a lot depends upon 
where you're sitting in the symphony orchestra of higher education. Uh, NYU, even though the name is New York University, is a private university. As Gordon mentioned, NYU Abu Dhabi, no student pays what he or she can't pay. I mean, if a very wealthy student goes, they pay NYU tuition. But 95% of the students get financial aid and nobody borrows to go. And there's no differential based on whether you're from the Emirates or not from the Emirates, from the United States, not from the United States. So now, so I speak with some purity when I say in the United States, for example, if you go to the University of Michigan, there's something called in-state tuition and out-of-state tuition. And that's because at most very, when, when Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the ruler of the Emirates, asked me, when will we know that NYU Abu Dhabi really has succeeded? I facetiously said to him, when you're losing an enormous amount of money. <laughs> this is not a business, higher education. I mean, they're off for profit. That's a whole different issue. I'm not defending that, okay? But when you're not in the for-profit space, think of, do you know of any other industrial sector or economic sector in the world that not only gives away its best product for free, but pays people to take it? That's what we do with the PhD at research universities. So, so I, I mean, this is, it, 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 it's not a question of whether the in-state students at the University of Michigan are benefiting from a tariff against out-of-state students, and you see the obvious metaphor, but which is getting subsidized more or less. And I think it's not an unreasonable thing to subsidize through the taxpayer in public universities. And I'm not carrying my own brief. Internal students whose parents are paying the taxes as opposed to external that, are, that aren't. So the, the, that's just a quick answer to that. Now, on this issue of um, dialogue within universities, uh, you're completely right. I go into this at great length, and, and part of it is a refusal on my part to accept the narrative. I mean, you get a kind of zeitgeist narrative that, that tends to occupy the field. And, and uh, I, I have a brilliant uh, NYU Abu Dhabi uh, 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 colleague on, on the faculty there named Frank Luntz, who actually has been the master poet of this for uh, conservative political causes, you know, uh, coming up with words like, call it the death tax, and people will be against it. If you call it an inheritance tax, they'll be, they'll, they'll be, they'll be for it. And, call it climate change, not global warming. This is all his ingenious framing of issues. Framing can be important. And I will resist I, 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 the fact that there is not, it is the experience of those of us who live in universities <clears throat> that there is aggressive dialogue across a spectrum. I will tell you, I was 14 years away from NYU Law School. I have now returned. Uh, and I get the delight of going to every faculty meeting at NYU Law School. Uh, I never speak. I raise my hand only for what the dean wants, which is what you should do if you're a faculty member. And uh, <laughs> just whatever the president or dean wants, believe in them. They are your colleagues who are giving up what they love doing most, their own research and teaching. But in any case, the, the spectrum of viewpoint across the NYU Law School faculty is broader than the spectrum of viewpoint ac across the United States Supreme Court. And the, the seriousness of faculty meetings on appointments or on issues, or the colloquia, which are this, you know, there are about 10 colloquia a week on different topics from constitutional law to tax law to intellectual property. I, I mean, you go to those and this, so, so it just isn't true that, 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 that there's a hegemonic political belief. Now, somebody said earlier, correctly, that you can track and relate education and people's voting in the general population. It's remarkable when you take that inside, and there's a lot of surveying, it's all in my book, of faculties and it's interesting, the most comfortable faculties on American, uh, faculty members on, 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 on American campuses self-describe as conservative. And the largest group self-describes as moderate. Now, now, I do worry about 
hegemony of a different kind, and I spell out the threats inside and outside the university. And one of the threats inside the university is, is a kind of uh, 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 subject capture. You know, when rational choice theory takes over a discipline, a, a, a discipline and only that can be heard. And, and I take a very eccentric view about the role of the president or the dean in, in the context of dialogue inside. The, the uber concern is the perpetuation of the dialogue. And that means giving up your own rights of expression. So in my 28 years, okay, 28 years as dean and president, I never once wore a button, even for things I deeply cared about. And my political views were not known to my students because I had to make sure that the dialogue continued. And if I was morally invested in one side, that's a very eccentric view. I did my doctoral dissertation on Charles Eliot, who invented, the, 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 as president of Harvard, the bully pulpit. So there is a contrary view. Uh, but it, it, getting back to where it all, you know, what happened to us, it, the closing, the conclusion of my book after my argument is called Being Worthy of Lisa. Lisa is my, my, my wife, and to this day, 13 years after her death, my love. And she said to me that the, one of the things, I think it was she said one of the things, I don't think she said it was the one thing, that she admired about me was my willingness to tilt windmills. She said, because if no one fights the fight, the fight will be lost. And we cannot get discouraged, and we have to keep uh, we, we, we have to use the rock uh, like a, an intellectual Archimedes on which the university allows us to stand to leverage it out. And I've got all kinds of ideas that I sum in the book, and then I've got this great idea about competitive debate for senior citizens, which I'm working on now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, send, send Mr. Bloomberg to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Gordon, will you take the question on, on what's happened to politics? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's such a... I, I, I was uh, with John at the Edinburgh Festival, and my first question to him was, what's happened to America? <laughs> and his first question to me was, what's happened to Britain? <laughs> and I think you realize, can, can I just tell a story about, uh, in the financial crisis in 2008, we, we had real problems to deal with. And I got together with Angela Merkel, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, Berlusconi, the Italian Prime Minister, the head of the European Central Bank, and Barroso, the head of the European Commission in Paris. And it was just at the start of the crisis. Lehman Brothers, remember that, had collapsed. And nobody knew how many banks were going to collapse. Ben Bernanke later said he thought 19 out of 20 American banks might have collapsed. And we were sitting in Paris, and we were spending uh, the first hour talking about you know, what, what we did about this. And I had an analysis that European banks were actually as badly uh, uh, capitalized as, as American banks, and we had to act very quickly. My colleagues were more or less saying that, you know, it was an American problem. We, Britain, were stupid. We were getting involved with the Americans, and that was, uh, we had the same Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, problem. So we had this debate about the banks. And Berlusconi was there, and he said absolutely nothing. Uh, and, and, and then we brought for coffee. And then suddenly, he was heard saying to Trichet, who was the head of the central bank, amateurs, and he was speaking French, really. amateurs, c'est son amateur. And we're thinking, Berlusconi, he's got the solution to the crisis. We're all <laughs> amateurs, he's got the solution. And then suddenly he says, amateurs, he said, don't they realize we've got a press conference in an hour's time? <laughs> and none of them have brought a makeup artist. <laughs> now, here we, we were dealing with one of the most complex problems <laughs> that you can imagine. And, and Berlusconi was, in a sense, the first populist. I mean, you know, he, 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 he was riding a, a sort of tiger against Europe, uh, and, 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 and he was, uh, his interest was his image, obviously. I mean, that's what he was worried about, the makeup artist. Uh, but he was a populist. But what he then found was, in Italy, his populist anti-Europeanism and his anti-immigration policies they were overtaken within a year or two by the Northern League and the Five Stars Movement, who are even more extreme populists. And now if you look at Italy, you actually see that there's this Brothers of Italy group that has emerged and getting votes in the European election, and they're regarded as, as neo-fascist. And so you have this populism that starts with a sort of anti-establishment, uh, you know, and, and, and fair enough, but then it, it descends into more anti-immigration, uh, more anti, uh, more racist uh, uh, expressions, 
and then you get into something that is uh, completely unacceptable in, in democratic politics today. And so what we have seen over the last uh, 10 years, and I perhaps didn't describe it as well as I should have in this sort of, in, in very shorter remarks at, at the beginning, is we've seen there was an attempt at international cooperation. People were worried about how globalization was failing them. People felt that uh, things were out of control. It was like a train running out of control and uncontrollable. That's how people were seeing things. And so the, the obvious thing was to say, take back control. That was the slogan in the European referendum. Take back control. Take back control from whichever elite, whichever group you thought was responsible for things, things going wrong. But take back control quickly became anti-something. It became anti-immigration. It became anti uh, uh, all sorts of uh, people who were set, thought to stand in the way. Nationalism then appeared, and it's a populist form of nationalism. It's either uh, nationalism against a, a business elite or it's a nationalism against a political elite. So what we've seen over the last uh, 10, 10 years, not just in, in Britain uh, with Brexit, but we've seen it right across Europe and we're seeing it in America. I mean, nobody's in any doubt when Trump says, make America great again, what is the undertone is make America white again. And that's the sort of politics that we're actually seeing uh, right across the world. And it is so easy. You've got a complex problem. You find it difficult to deal with it. You resort to populist measures. You get temporary success. And until we learn that you've got to actually debate these issues out, you've got to challenge uh, uh, people's prejudices, uh, you've got to challenge assumptions that be made. We've got to learn from John about uh, uh, d debating these, these things out. Uh, we will not escape populism. Uh, we'll not escape populist nationalism. We, we have got to make, as Orwell said, the moral effort to do so. And that means it's not just about them. It's about us doing something about it ourselves. It's about us joining this debate. It's about us entering the public square. It's about us challenging what we think is wrong. It's about us, I think, I've got to say, finding a moral and ethical basis for our politics in solidarity, cooperation, sharing, and empathy with other people. Nationalism replaces empathy by enmity. It replaces uh, reciprocity, which is a feature of our society and should be uh, by building up resentments. It replaces solidarity by uh, selfishness. Uh, it replaces cooperation by conflict. Uh, we've got to make the moral effort to overcome it. So it does, in the end, not just come down to them who we can blame for what's going wrong, it does come down to us. Thank you. Bravo. My apologies to the top row. I'm, I think we're out of time. I wanted to thank John for reminding us of the power of universities and what role they can play in shaping society. I wanted to thank Gordon for reminding us of what politics could be and should be and what we should all aspire to. And thanks to all of you for coming this evening. John will be signing books here on stage. If you would like to, the books are outside and there'll be a queue forming here to line up to sign the books. Thank you all again for joining us this evening. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Whatever you wanted. <laughs>